And in this video, as the trial of the nurse Lucy Letby nears its conclusion, the jury now hear from the judge and his final summing up of the case against Lucy Letby. The judge refers to the case of child L and child M and their birth on April 8th, 2016 at the Countess of Chester Hospital. The judge says it is alleged Letby tried to kill child L by putting insulin into bags of dextrose. Professor Hindmarsh said the hypoglycemia episode for child L lasted from April 9th to 11th and multiple bags had insulin added. He said a quote, not noticeable amount of insulin, 0.1 mil, would have been added to the 500 mil bag, which would not change the colour. He was of the opinion that two or three bags, depending on how many bags were hung, had insulin added. He said while sticky insulin would account for some of the hypoglycemia, over time more insulin would have had to have been added via a bag. Letby worked four long day shifts from April 6th to 9th and had moved house during that time to Westbourne Road, Chester. She said April 9th was still fairly busy on the unit. After birth on April 8th, child L's blood sugar was a bit low at 1.9. The court had heard this was normal for premature babies, so he was started on glucose. Reference to hypoglycemic pathway was mentioned that milk should be given to infants before an infusion of glucose. Neonatal practitioner Amy Davies said she had no concerns for child L regarding putting him on an alternative pathway. Dr. Bomick wrote the rate of the glucose infusion. Letby said glucose bags were kept in room 1 and insulin was kept in the equipment room. She could not recall if any of the bags were kept under lock and key. The first bag was 10% dextrose at noon on April 8th. Colleague Amy Davies denied administering insulin, saying that would only be given to babies with a blood sugar level over 12 and would only be prescribed by a doctor. This was the 60th case Dr Evans looked at, the court is told. He saw the relation between insulin and insulin C peptide in the blood plasma laboratory result for child L. He suggested to police a specialist should be approached to review his findings. Professor Hindmarsh said neonates have higher glucose requirements and any blood sugar level under 2.4 to 2.6 is a cause for concern, so it was appropriate for the initial dextrose infusion. For the night of April 8th to 9th, there were no concerns for child L, and all the blood glucose readings were above 2. No fluid bags were changed during the night shift. For the day shift of April 9th, Mary Griffiths was the designated nurse for child L. She said he was stable. Professor Hindmarsh says child L was hypoglycemic by 10am on April 9th, and insulin must have been added between midnight and 9.30am. He said it is fairly easy to insert insulin into the portal of the bag via a needle. The judge says Professor Hindmarsh said at least three bags contained insulin to maintain the low blood sugar levels for child L. The insulin could have been added to the bags at the same time, he added. He said once it was in the bag, it would not be known by smell or appearance. The type of insulin used was fast acting, the court was told. Mary Griffiths said it was quite a shock the blood glucose levels for child L dropped after the dextrose was administered. Let be said in evidence she had nothing to do with insulin in the bags and could not assist with an explanation why the blood sugar level was so low. She said she had nothing to do with the bags prior to changing them. Mary Griffiths could not recall if the bag was changed. A plasma blood sample was taken, but podding was late, the court had heard, due to the collapse of child L's twin, child M. The evidence, the judge says, is the blood sample was taken between noon when child L had a 1.6 blood sugar reading and 3.35pm. The blood sample passed all the quality control tests and performance checks at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. The judge tells the jury, in short, there is no evidence to doubt the reliability of the test results. The insulin and the insulin C peptide results were the wrong way around from what they should have been. Child L's insulin level of 1,099 should have meant an insulin C peptide of 5 to 10,000, but it was 264. The court had heard said it was therefore synthetic insulin that was administered and to do so was dangerous. Clinical biochemist Dr Anna Milan said there wasn't anything that doubted the accuracy of the results. In cross-examination, she explained in the case of insulin, 
If the sample had not been treated appropriately, the insulin level would have been even higher, and insulin C peptide was stable. Professor Highmarsh said the 1099 reading was a minimum, not a maximum. Let B in interview said the original blood sugar levels for child L were not a huge surprise for a neonate. She said very prolonged low blood sugar levels can cause brain damage and even death. She said it was not common for babies to be given insulin. She said they had access to the hypoglycemia pathway on the unit. She said any addition to an infusion bag would be very rare and have to be prescribed by a doctor and would have to be administered via syringe on the bag port. She replied, that wasn't done by me, to the accusation the bags had been sabotaged. She said an explanation would be that insulin would be in one of the bags and denied responsibility. The prosecution say there is uncontrovertible evidence Childair was poisoned with insulin before 10am on April 9th and accounted for persistent low blood sugar levels. They say this happened when Letby was on shift. Blood sugar levels improved on April 11th. The prosecution says from the second 15% dextrose bag on that day, child L was no longer being infused with insulin. Letby said the initial low blood sugar levels for child L on April 8th showed naturally resolving hypoglycemia. She accepted only she and Belinda Simcock had been on duty for the child F and child L events when the babies first had serious low blood sugar readings. She denied doing anything to harm child L. The judge refers to the case of child M, who the court had heard was not an intensive care baby, but put next to child L on April 9th. At 11am, he had a small posset, as noted by Mary Griffith, and 1.5ml of bile-stained fluid was aspirated at 12.30pm. Child M was to be nil by mouth, a decision made by a registrar. At 3.45pm, Child M received antibiotics, the prescription by Letby and Mary Griffith, and administered by one of the two nurses. At 4pm, Mary Griffith had been preparing a 12.5% dextrose infusion for Child L. The parents had left a few minutes earlier. Child M collapsed at this time. Letby said, quote, Yes, it's an event, it needs to be sorted. And the resuscitation call was put out. Dr Jram was crash bleeped. A nurse colleague said her role was to draw up the resuscitation drugs. She was shown a piece of paper towel referring to entries on clinical notes for times and medications administered. She recognised her handwriting of, quote, adrenaline made. That note was subsequently recovered from a Morrison's bag in Letby's bedroom at the time of her arrest in July 2018, along with a blood gas record for child M. The nurse said the practice was to put the note in the confidential waste bin or the clinical waste bin where it would be incinerated. The judge says it is the prosecution's case that let be recovered the note from the bin afterwards. Child M was not breathing for himself and required doses of adrenaline in the resuscitation, which lasted under 30 minutes. They reached a point, the judge said, where Child M might not survive. Then Child M suddenly picked up his breathing and heart rate. Dr Jram said he saw pink patches blotches on the abdomen of child M that moved around. He noticed it was similar to what he had seen with child A. He first mentioned this in his witness statement. He said his priority at the time was communicating with parents and post-resuscitation care. He said himself and his colleagues sat down on June 29, 2016 to discuss the findings. Dr Jram said someone mentioned air embolus. He researched it in literature and he shared that research the following day with colleagues. In cross-examination, he said he had not appreciated the clinical significance of the skin discoloration at the time. He rejected the assertion he did not note it at the time because it did not happen or that admitting it was incompetence. He said at the time there were other things going on. He agreed that after Child D had died, Dr Stephen Brewery had carried out an informal review of events at that time and that Letby was associated with those events. In police interview, Letby denied doing anything to harm Child M. She did not know why Child M desaturated. She said she had been drawing up medications at the time of the collapse. She thought she had taken the paper towel home inadvertently, not emptying her pockets. 
She said the paper towel might have been put to one side. She denied she had kept it to keep a record of the attack. In evidence, she said Child L and Child M stood out as she had been the allocated nurse for when they were delivered. Child M was not in an allocated space on the nursery, she recalled, and maybe things would have been different if he had been in an allocated space. She did not recall seeing any discoloration, did not recall having any description of skin discoloration being mentioned to her, and any discoloration would have been difficult for her to see. Letby said her taking home the notes was an error and denied taking them from the confidential waste bin. She added she cared for the twins on subsequent days quite frequently, during which time there were no adverse incidents. Paediatric neuroradiologist Dr Stiveros provided agreed evidence in which he said child M had shown signs of brain damage likely caused by the collapse on April 9th, 2016. Professor Owen Arthurs viewed radiographic images for child M and said they could not support or refute an air embolus. Dr Evans concluded there were no concerns for child M prior to the collapse, save for one bilus aspirate for which he was put nil by mouth. He did not believe that caused a collapse as child M's stomach was empty. He believed a noxious substance or air was administered to child M's circulation, i.e. intravenously, and could not explain a natural cause for child M's rapid recovery, ruling out infection. He said that taking into account Dr J Ram's description of the skin discoloration, the cause for child M's collapse was an air embolus. In cross-examination, he accepted there was no empirical research for how air dissipated in the body following a collapse and based it on physiology that cardiac massage would dissipate it. He said if the air goes around the abdominal area, it would result in skin discoloration, and if it heads towards the brain, it can cause neurological damage. He said very little air is required to cause collapse. Dr Sandy Bowen said child M had no markers of infection. She had to find some way to explain how a baby previously well suddenly collapsed and had prolonged resuscitation for which she almost didn't make it, then recovered rapidly. She said the skin discoloration seen by Dr Jram was compatible with air embolus. She said the actual volume to cause a baby to collapse and die is unknown. She said if it was a small volume, it would take some minutes to get to child M in this case as he was on a slow infusion. In cross-examination, Dr Bowen accepted most babies die in the case of air embolus, but it was not inevitable. She could not think of an alternative medical cause from her differential diagnosis. She said the type of cardiac arrest suffered by child M was incredibly unusual. The judge refers to the case of child N, born on June 2nd, 2016 at the Countess of Chester Hospital. He says the prosecution case is child N had three unexpected collapses in June 2016, that they are all attributable to inflicted trauma by Letby and were acts carried out with the intention to murder him. The defence case is Letby did not harm child N, that there are inconsistencies in the accounts, and the jury cannot be sure Letby intended to murder child N. Child N had intermittent grunting, and it was recorded at 3.10pm on June 2nd that he had a desaturation to 67% for a minute and was crying, as recorded by nurse Caroline Oakley. He was placed in a hot cot and reviewed by Dr Yuko. The nurse said she had no recollection of events other than that in her notes. There was nothing to suggest the nasogastric tube was moved after it was placed, or that there were difficulties placing it on child N. For the night of June 2nd to 3rd, Christopher Booth was the designated nurse for child N. Let B have messaged a colleague to say they had a baby with haemophilia, and in evidence said staff were panicked by this. The prosecution say Letby was messaging a colleague constantly from 8pm while feeding a baby in a nursery, which was a two-handed job. She refuted a suggestion in cross-examination that she had force-fed her designated baby at the time, saying the note of the feed must have happened at a different time. Dr Jennifer Lockerhan reviewed child N and saw he was pink and well-perfused, and consideration was given to starting enteral feeds. Christopher Booth had no concerns as he went on his break. He handed over care to a nurse when he went on his break at 1am, but could not remember who that was. 
the other colleagues cannot recall caring for child N. Child N had a deterioration to 40% at 1.05am, a significant desaturation, and child N was, quote, screaming, Dr. Loggerhan had noted. She said she had no direct recollection of that, and said she would not usually have written that word. At 2 a.m., Child N had recovered, was settled, and was asleep. Christopher Booth recorded there had been no further episodes for Child N following that desaturation. The baby remained nil by mouth. The prosecution case is Letby sabotaged Child N in some way to cause the collapse. Letby said she had no memory and did not know Child N had collapsed. She said she did not believe it was a collapse which required resuscitation. She denied using the absence of Christopher Booth as an opportunity to sabotage Child N. The prosecution say the second and third events for Child N happened on June 15, 2016. There had been no concerns for Child N on June 14 at handover for the night shift by nurse Jennifer Jones Key. At 1am, Child N was pale, mottled and very veiny, with slight abdominal distension. He was reviewed by a doctor who observed mottling, a potential sign of sepsis, but was otherwise normal. On further observation, Child N had five minor desaturations which had resolved and the mottling had gone. Child N's oral feeds were stopped and he was given antibiotics and glucose. The defence say these were signs of Child N deteriorating. At 7.15am, Child N had another desaturation. The prosecution say Letby, who had arrived early for her day shift, did something to cause the collapse. Letby said she had gone to see Child N as she had had him the previous day shift. The profound desaturation caused Child N's heart rate to be affected. A male doctor had been called to attend Child N and recorded a desaturation to 48%. He decided to move Child N to nursery room 1 and attempted to intubate. He saw blood which prevented him from seeing the airway. The back of Child N's throat looked unusual with swelling and he was not sure where the blood was coming from. He made three unsuccessful attempts to intubate and suction did not clear the view enough. He remembered Letby was helping with the attempted intubation. A chest x-ray confirmed no pulmonary hemorrhage. The trial judge says Letby in police interview said she remembered Child N had an unusual airway issue and was very difficult to intubate. She was asked about intensive care charts and references to blood. She said if the NGT had been inserted forcefully, it could cause about one mil of blood. She did recall Child N bleeding at the time of intubation, but was not sure why. In her second interview, Letby said she would arrive prior to 7.30am for her day shift. She went to talk to Jennifer Jones Key, her colleague. She referred to her colleague's note of Child M being pale and veiny overnight. His condition deteriorated. In cross-examination, it was put to Letby that observation charts showed nothing deteriorating for Child N. Letby said she was stood at the doorway and Child N's deterioration happened within minutes. He was bluish and not breathing. For the intubation, Letby recalled blood being seen and her interpretation of the note was blood was seen once intubation had been attempted. In the family communication note, Letby wrote parents were contacted, phones were switched off and a message was left. In cross-examination, Letby agreed she had written out the 7.15am incident as she had taken care of child N from 7.30am. The first time she recalled seeing blood was after the second desaturation at 3pm for child N. The judge says there was a dispute over previously agreed evidence on who made a call to child N's parents. A further desaturation happened at 2.50pm after the parents left the ward. Dr Maybury was crash called to child N who had desaturated. He could see vocal cords but there was substantial swelling in the airway and did not recall seeing any blood. Dr. Saladi recalled seeing blood in the oropharynx and blood in the NG tube. Child N was later intubated successfully by the Alderhey transport team. Child N continued to have episodes of apnea, but they were less serious and recovered at Alderhey. Let be noted, quote, approximately 1450 infant became apneic with desaturations to 44%, heart rate 90 beats per minute. Fresh blood noted from mouth and three mils of blood aspirated from NG tube. 
Neopuff commenced and doctors crash called, unable to obtain secure airway. She said after the free meal aspiration of blood, she had some memory of events. There was a sense of panic on the unit and it was chaotic. She said there was no factor 8 left, so some was brought over from Alderhay. She said child M was the focus of the whole unit at that point. She said she was stressed and anxious as they couldn't get an airway. Professor Sally Kinsey gave evidence on haemophilia and the purpose of factor 8. Child N had moderate haemophilia and would need factor 8 when it was required, not on a regular basis. She did not see any issue of child N's blood which caused her collapses. She said a spontaneous bleed could not be explained by haemophilia as a baby could not damage themselves in the throat and any instrumentation could potentially cause bleeding. A pulmonary hemorrhage was not a viable explanation. The defence do not suggest it was spontaneous bleeding or pulmonary hemorrhage. They point to when witnesses saw the bleeding. Child N was the 29th case Dr Evans looked at. The event on June the 3rd was unusual, particularly the screaming and crying. He said something must have been done to him and it was not an air embolus. For June 15th, Dr Evans said the bleed was a consequence of trauma. Dr Bowen said the June 3rd desaturation was life-threatening and she had never experienced a baby crying for 30 minutes or screaming. She said child N had received a painful stimulus. For June 15th, she believed a bleed was a consequence of trauma.